Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elamotem, and today, in this rather personal episode, Jacob Lawrence and I will share with you exactly how we realized Monteverdi's beautiful motet, O Quam Pulcra Es. There is often a gap between how music was notated and how it was performed. In the case of early 17th century monodies, pieces for voice and basso continuo, the gap manifests itself in two main areas. The singers, as part of their job, added ornaments and diminutions that are not written on their part, and accompanists, as part of their job, created full realization above their given bass lines. In this episode, we will share with you exactly how we realized a motet by Monteverdi, from the vocal ornaments to the exact notes of the basso continuo realization. Let's start. The piece that we will look at is O Quam Pulcra Es, a motet by Claudio Monteverdi for tenor and basso continuo. It appears in a collection from 1625, which we have mentioned on this channel several times already. And like some other motets from the collection, it paraphrases verses from the Song of Songs. The way that we will examine it is by following a score that includes a modern transcription of the original parts, written as much as possible like the original with its weird barring, along with two additional staffs, what Jacob actually sang when the microphones were on and what I actually played on the keyboard. The idea here is not that we present an ideal version of how this piece should be realized, but merely what we did on that one day in June in a beautiful church in Graubünden, Switzerland. What's more, we didn't make this recording for the purpose of making this episode. When recording, we didn't think that we would share it. So writing out what we did, note for note, after the fact, turned out to be a very interesting experience. We now have to take responsibility for the semi-improvised things that we did. Is it improvisation? It depends whom you ask. I would say that unless you read a piece for the first time, it's more like performing something you already know, but simply not committing it to paper. If you have enough time to try out and find what works and what does not in the specific situation you are in, you may end up with a certain optimized version that is more or less the same every time. If it's for a recording, there is no merit in having it different every time just for the sake of having it different every time. Just choose the best options and stick with them. If, however, something in the setting has changed, another instrument, another room, or maybe even your mood or stamina, you may be forced to change something. In that case, it's good you didn't write it down. Before we get down to the music, we have to discuss some basics in Basso Continuo. When playing from a part which is practically unfigured, like Monteverdi's part in this motet, we should have a general guide for how to decide whether a chord will be major or minor, and whether it will be a 5-3 chord or a 6-3 chord. Francesco Bianciardi, the writer of possibly the earliest Basso Continuo treatise, tried to give some rules of thumb to help beginners in choosing the right harmonies. We mentioned his 1607 treatise in our episode about the rule of the octave, but for your convenience, I'll quickly summarize his very short rules here. 1. One should add consonances of thirds and fifths above notes. The quality of the thirds, minor or major, should be in accordance with the mode. 2. When a perfect fifth does not fit naturally above a note, it should be replaced by a sixth. 3. When the bass ascends by a fourth, or descends by a fifth, which is the same, it should have a major harmony. 4. When the bass ascends by a fifth, or descends by a fourth, it may have a minor harmony. 5. When the bass descends a second or a fourth, or ascends a fifth, one may use a sixth as a passing note. 6. Cadences conclude with a major harmony. These rules don't work all the time, but they do work most of the time, and are definitely a good start. In our analysis, figures that were given by Monteverdi, or are implied from the composed voice, will be in black, figures which conform with Bianciardi's rules, or are part of a cadence, will be in blue, 
and figures where I chose otherwise will be in red. Beyond these guidelines, something which is absolutely necessary when realizing basso continuo is the knowledge of cadences. As in this music, there are as many cadences as there are commas in written text. If you need a bit of a reminder, check out our relevant episodes about cadences. A slightly more advanced issue that we have to mention now is the difference between accompanying a soprano or a tenor. When realizing a piece for basso continuo and a soprano, one may use the written vocal part as a basis for the top part of the realization. In many written out accompaniments from this period, we see just that. The solo voice is doubled in the realization in a simplified manner. Once you have the lowest and highest parts in your realization, all you need to add are the inner parts. In tenor monodies, the idea is similar, only that when doubling the tenor at pitch, typically in the left hand together with the bass, one needs to add the top voice, which is a more demanding task, as it's much more audible. If one were to double the tenor solo in the right hand an octave higher, this would create constant parallel octaves between the singer and the realization. This is something that we don't find in any source, and is specifically warned about in some treatises. And so, when accompanying a tenor, one has to more or less double the tenor line at pitch, and then come up with a reasonable top line. By the way, if you are interested to learn more about early basso continuo, you might want to check out the free online publication I did recently together with Augusta Campagne for the Scola Cantorum in Basel. Links on the footnotes page. Interestingly, while it's great to know many sources, the real key to early basso continuo is to have the greatest acquaintance possible with the musical language of that time, as well as being practiced in the rules of counterpoint. Now that you know the real secret of this art, we can finally look at Monteverdi. As you see, the piece starts off with a wondrous exclamation. Oh, oh, how beautiful you are! Monteverdi chose to render this first exclamation on a single note with a fermata. Some sources discuss how to perform the first note of a piece. Methods range from a subtle dynamic effect to highly virtuosic melismas. In this case, on this day, Jacob chose to sing the note simply, but with a subtle mesa di voce. In the realization, you can see all the figures that were added thanks to the rules of Bianciardi. On the passing sixths before going back to the D, I added a fancy gruppo ornament. After it, there is no rule to tell us specifically what harmony to put on the D, but because we just started with a major harmony and in the next bar a major harmony is called for again, I thought it would just be nice to stick with the major harmony. On the text, my love, my dove, my beauty, the music repeats three times. Despite Monteverdi writing too trilly each time, Jacob varied it by only singing trilly the second time, and on the third time adding accenti instead. In the accompaniment, I changed the position of the chords the second time, just for variety. Then comes another wondrous moment, this time with a big diminution followed by a cadence. On the sequence of eight notes, you'll hear how Jacob grooves the note values a little, in a way which is demonstrated in many sources. Throughout the performance, you may notice that most of Jacob's diversions from the original part are on this relatively subtle level. This is because Monteverdi already included many written-out ornaments in the vocal line. Looking at the keyboard realization, in order to keep the simplified line of the singer in my realization at the cadence, I changed the position of the parts. I concluded with a typical gruppo in the cantizans. Let's listen.
The following part starts with yet another kind of wonder, this time a more sad or sweet one. Monteverdi reaches to the high E flat, turns it into a seventh by changing the bass, and then illegally leaps from it instead of resolving it correctly by descending a step. This gives a very painful and beautiful effect. The way I dealt with it in the accompaniment is basically by avoiding it. What I did do is present some movement of quarter notes just before and just after it, as I found that it helped with the flow. Then, on the word columbarum, doves, there is a beautiful ascending diminution that I decided to complement with descending movements of passing notes. On the last note of this phrase, the F, we thought that a sharp was missing. It's not that something would be wrong without it, it's just that it would result in an exceptionally unusual progression. Should one prefer it without the sharp, and could find similar musical examples to back it up, that would be fine also. now speaks of the hair of the loved one. To raise the excitement, I added octaves in the bass, an option we find in several sources. At the end of this phrase, I did what I said one should avoid. I doubled the tenor an octave above its pitch. You did what? Well, I'm sorry. To be fair, for two notes only, it doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that. On the word dentes, teeth, Jacob and I followed the hidden triple meter and played it as if it was written with a meter change. Practically speaking, we sang it a bit faster. This is also the reason I did not strike the F on the following measure, as I wanted to avoid accentuating the weak syllable of the word tui. The following cadence is prepared with a crunchy dissonance of a ninth. To add some oil to the fire, with the resolution of this ninth, I changed the third of the chord from minor to major a common and spicy trick, which is by no means obligatory. Leading to yet another version of Wonder, this time with a written out accelerating figure in the voice, I made a little and simple connection. Let's listen. The following part starts with a tripla proportion. Theoretically, in the place of one semibrieve, you should have now three. We found such a proportion, in this case, to be slightly too slow, so we tried to keep the relaxed and majestic affect, but with a bit more flowing tempo. At this time, one may find several examples where the music suggests proportions different from the official theoretical ones. In these cases, we just try out different options and see what works in our opinion. Still, you'll see that in this and in the next triple meter sections, the relatively slower pace allowed both Jacob and me to add some little ornaments. And now, after praising the beauty of the loved one through the song, there is finally a change. Now the lover asks for action and explains. Leave, he says, and come to me for I languish with love. The first leave, egredere, is part of the lovely triple section, but then it comes again in a much more serious way, which made Jacob, perhaps, add the rather painful ornament on the first veni, come. We have already seen several times on this channel how composers used chromaticism to express languishing with love. Monteverdi is no different, 
only that on top of it, he adds sighing suspensions. The effect works very well. The way I dealt with it in the realization is quite straightforward. Just as I did most of the time, I simply put the tenor line in its place and added a simple top line. The low G I realized as if a cadenza doppia to C were starting but then evaded, taking us to a soft tenor cadence on the low D. You might notice that at the last moment I left the tenor and didn't double it, and by this made a cadence without a cantizans. You did what? Well, I did try once to play it with one, but with this organ and acoustics, it just sounded too low and boomy, so I decided on this solution. One last comment on this phrase. I added the basso continuo figures for you here, but in such convoluted contrapuntal moments, I find that the simplification that the figures offer doesn't really help. You should simply know and internalize the progression. Let's listen. The following part consists of alternating sections of duple and triple meter, with more and more excitement before the final climax of the piece. Again, the protagonist is languishing for love, in a similar sighing way as before, but in addition to that, now their soul also becomes liquid, liquefacta est. In my realization, I followed a similar strategy, doubling the tenor in its place and figuring out the voices around it. Like the equivalent place from before, also here, on the D, there is an evaded cadenza doppia. And also here I made a little mistake. I really like the addition of the A over the suspended G. It brings a really nice effect. However, what happened was that this A stayed there, and then, once again, for two notes, I doubled the tenor an octave higher. Man, come on! What's more, in trying to run away from this doubling, I then jumped from the G to the C sharp, creating a terrible melodic interval. Luckily though, it kind of fit the rather harsh and dissonant music. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that. Approaching the final cadence, we have yet another cadence with a typical gruppo, which connects to a stock diminution that acts as a bridge to the final climax of the piece. Then, another evaded cadenza doppia, another ninth suspension, where I changed the third of its resolution from minor to major, and a very lightly ornamented final cadence. Let's listen.
This was our version of Monteverdi's beautiful motet, we hope you enjoyed it. For us it was a rather special experience to write down and share all these little details, we certainly learned a lot from it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and the complete and uninterrupted performance of the piece. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.